Hey everyone, I have a really exciting dividend stock investing video for all of you today. This one is truly special. I am going to guest interview Greg on my channel today. Greg is an investor in our community who I met through Instagram and he is just months away from living the dividend dream, from living off of passive income from dividend stocks at 40 years of age. Greg is a normal person who works a normal job and he has figured it out. He has a dividend stock investing strategy. He has a budgeting strategy, a personal finance strategy, where basically he has amassed a large enough portfolio to cover all of his living expenses from dividend checks alone. And right now, quite frankly, he could retire tomorrow, but he is continuing to work a little bit longer here to stockpile even more cash for his financial stability. And so we are really lucky to have Greg on the channel today. And he is, by the way, the dividend monster. If you check him out on Instagram, I will link to that in the pinned comment below. He shares his portfolio updates on Instagram. He's an awesome guy. I'm so excited about the interview today. Let's welcome Greg to the channel. Welcome to PPC Ian. This is Dividend Stock Investing for Everyone. Really appreciate it, my friend. And um, so I'm going to jump into the questions. I have a lot of questions uh, for you today. And so, Greg, can you just tell me a bit about yourself? Um. Well, I'm a very much a dedicated dividend investor. Love it. Um, I call myself a recreational philosopher because it's uh, one of my hobbies. I'm also into um, working out, exercise, uh, healthy living, and um, gaming, streaming. I have a lot of hobbies, but uh, biggest one, obviously, the reason that we're here today is I love building dividend portfolios and sharing knowledge on how to create your own income stream through buying a passive income to the stock market. That's great. And um, for all of you who don't know, the way that uh, Greg and I actually met was on Instagram. He goes by the handle The Dividend Monster. I will link to him in the pin comment below so you can all follow him on Instagram. And um, one of the things that has impressed me so much about Greg is the progression of his dividend stock portfolio. He's very transparent and shares that portfolio on Instagram. And it's getting um, pretty substantial. And what's so exciting is he's going to be living off of those dividends in the not so distant future. So I wanted to start with that. Greg, could you just tell the subscribers, the community out there about where you're at with your dividend investing journey and how close are you to living that um, financial independence dream? Um, what I've been telling people is that I hope to embracing a form of fire, whether you call it lean fire mm -hmm. or whatever, within by the middle of next year. Wow. So I'm giving myself to the middle of next year to kind of buffer my savings a little bit and get my passive income stream. It's, I tell people on paper, I already generate enough passive income through dividends to pay my bills as it is, but that's also before taxes mm -hmm. and before that's with the most boilerplate lifestyle, which is kind of the one that I live now. Um, so I, because I don't want to just, cut it close. I don't, I don't want to just scrape by. I'm giving myself extra time to work. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of doing so is allowing my drip system to continue until my numbers get where they need to be. So that's, that's kind of where I am now. That's amazing. And what does that feel like? Like, are you just incredibly like excited? Like, do you kind of wake up every morning, like just with a smile on your face, knowing that you are so close to that dream? Like, what does that feel like for people out there in the community who kind of like myself have a longer amount of time to go? Um, what's it like? I would say that's absolutely correct. It's funny you say the smile on the face thing, because a lot of the people that I work with make the joke 
that I must I must have my ideas about finance together because they see me. I'm always smiling, mm -hmm. even when I'm having I'm having uh, stressful days, which are all, unfortunately almost all of them. I'm always, you know, trying to find a way to to uh, be humorous and lighthearted and, and fun about it and always entertaining people. And I just say, yeah, I have that. I would say that's that's mostly true. I wake up even when I'm tired. Which, again, when we get into the details of my work, we can elaborate on that. Yeah. I remind myself that no matter how terrible the day is going to be, I'm this close. Like, yeah. it's starting to all pay off. And, yes, it's a reinforcing. It's like whoever came up with the snowball. I know, I know Dave Ramsey uses a lot, but I doubt he created the term. It's like when, when the ball, for me, has rolled down the hill for so long, and has accumulated so much size and you're that close to letting it just roll, roll, roll forever. It is very much, it's, it keeps me engaged. In mm -hmm. fact, I've been more engaged with my portfolio in the past, I'd say two years than I was probably the prior four or five. A lot of that has to do with Instagram and now we're all comparing notes and whatnot. It just keeps you very much engaged at a cognitive level. We're always like bouncing articles and sharing things with each other but knowing that i'm so close is absolutely it makes me stay committed it, it it makes makes it so there's not a single moment where i'm skeptical of my ability to do this this is amazing and th this is such an important message for the community out there because so many people in the dividend community feel and i felt this way in the journey at times where it's like when am I going to get there? Is it possible? Is it possible? Will it ever happen? And will it be at a young age? And Greg here is living proof, everyone, that at 40 years old, this dream is possible. But it gets even better. From my understanding, Greg is not a the CEO of a company or earning just some huge, huge windfall. He likes to call himself kind of, I would say, more of an ordinary person who has done this through more ordinary means. And so Greg, I'd love for you just to explain to the audience and share with everyone your story and what your work is all about. And um, from your perspective, um, if you could illustrate how dividend, this dividend dream, it is possible for ordinary people as well. It's absolutely possible. And I think it's not only possible for ordinary people, it's one of the most accessible mechanisms. And I think you even had a great video uh, Sometime last year, I want to say, where you talked about how, you know, there's only so many um, open position, uh, open spots in the corporate food chain. And sometimes yeah. you have to create your own mm -hmm. and that, uh, you know, uh, you and I agree on how we're often critical of um, when other people, they want to crack down on like dividend investing or make comments about it because they think it only affects the ultra rich. Yeah. And, not, and that, that's one of the biggest straw men uh, out there that, that's so far from the truth, because I know more people in the middle class and they're trying to get out. They're using very tactical dividend investing to get there. It's mm -hmm. not just it's certainly not. In fact, I don't even think the ultra rich would need it because most of the time they own they have their own businesses and real estate companies on top of their dividend stocks for a lot of us. A brokerage account may be the only mechanism other than paying down a mortgage that we have to generate returns above and beyond uh, of uh, inflation because we mm -hmm. know saving isn't going to get us there. Yeah. So, yes, I am absolutely um, going back to your original question. I, I'm a chemical operator. I work in the chemical industry. I've worked in that industry for um, 16 years now. Uh, without going into too much detail, I basically... Um, operate equipment and oversee a lot of different cooks and recipes and production. I'm a, I'm a production operator would be. And so I tell people that I often try to create a philosophy that is transparent and discernible and has a high degree of utility for people who may never be an upper management, may never have a six figure salary but they want to achieve some degree of fire and try to show them how starting with coming up with a savings plan and then a dedicated investing plan 
and how you can track your progress and how you use the stock market to eventually create a bill paying mechanism that event. And then eventually one day you will be able to pay your bills with passive income and no longer need to work. Yeah. And it's very much applicable to people in the middle class or blue collar workers. In fact, there's a lot of people who I talk to on Instagram who are in, are in the trades as well. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's not just like white collar clerical. It's, it, can, it can appeal to anybody. And that's the beauty of it. There's Absolutely. no barrier to entry other than a little bit of, of mental effort more mental effort as you go along and then some sort of fiscal discipline. And then you can create, it's even easier now than it was when I first started. It's unbelievable what technology has done for us. Yeah. I think you would agree the same probably when you first started, it was very hard to build these individual stock portfolios that we do today. You back when commissions were like 14, Mm -hmm. $15 and now we have M1 in the pie system and all that it's custom tailored for, for people to just, be able to build, uh, build and save, and you see more of it. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's why I love communicating these ideas to people. Yeah, I, I think uh, Greg brought up so many good points here. Um, and I, I would really underscore something he brought up early on this topic was dividends are for everyone. And there are a lot of risks that come with other avenues of acquiring wealth, such as starting a business. When someone starts a business, how many businesses actually succeed versus fail? So there's kind of that element to things. And what Greg also mentioned is that any company, there is a food chain. And as you get higher up in the company, one, the stress levels and the responsibility levels are way higher, but also there's just fewer positions available. And so this idea that dividend stocks, they really are available to anyone and anyone in the corporate food chain, no matter where they are, has access to dividend stocks. And you bring up a good point, my friend, that yes, the advent of zero commissions and buying fractional shares, and also just the knowledge share that's available now, the wealth of knowledge in the community that's out there um, on the internet has been so motivating for a whole new uh, class and a whole new um, community of dividend investors these days. Um, I wanted to follow on this this, uh, question uh, that you just answered with learning a bit more about your dividend strategy. What is your dividend strategy look like? How have you constructed your portfolio? That's a great question. I think um, I'll go back to, do you want me to go over how I first started investing as well? Yeah, let's do it. I think that would be really helpful as well. Yeah. Uh, I first got into investing in, I think, late 2004. And my dad had, he gave me, money that was saved from birthdays and like from grandparents and whatnot. And he had it in a Schwab account and he just gave it to me. And at the time, I mean, it was only, I swear it probably wasn't, uh, let's say two grand, two or three grand, Mm -hmm. but he had it as a custodial account and then he gave it to me. And that, the fact that I had it and I was looking at it every day, it inspired in me the desire to learn what these words were. I had a ticker, a mutual fund. I had no idea what a mutual fund was. So I had to go out and buy books and I had to educate myself on mutual funds. And then I started to understand the difference between different type of equity mutual funds and went from there. And then I said, okay, I was making good money at the time. I had just got this job and I was working a lot of overtime. So I was earning way more than I was spending. And I had a roommate back in the day. So my, my cost of living was super um, constrained and, and it allowed me to just pump some money into this. And through doing so, I kind of got addicted to it. Yeah. And it was even in back in 2004 and five, they, they weren't the best years, the mid two thousands uh, coming off um two nasty uh, bear markets after the tech bubble. There was a lot of pessimism about the stock market. Nobody was really all that thrilled about it. And then of course, and it got even worse in the financial crisis, but just through that learning and doing, it got me interested. And then I started saying, well, I don't want this one uh, total market fund. I started trying to get cute with the growth and the value and the small cap, mid cap. Started, Started studying standard asset allocation and modern portfolio theory and trying to figure out what's the optimal um, 
ratio of assets for me, I was in a lot of high risk mutual funds, a lot of like um, from the companies like Janus and, uh, yeah. and uh, American Century, just really aggressive, which was fine because at that age and just starting out, I didn't have a lot to lose. And then, of course, the financial crisis came and knocked me down about 40 percent from peak to trough. And that, that was a kind of learning experience. And luckily, uh, my high risk funds obviously didn't do very well. But when my overtime came back, because my business started rebounding very quickly in 09 or I, midway through 09, I started doubling down on that on that risk because my nice. my logic was if you lose it through risk, you want to try to get it back high beta you don't want to swap out at the nadir at the bottom absolutely that's what I, so i poured it back in and those funds rebounded the hardest and then once i was breaking even and seeing profits um doing things like i was buying high yield bonds back in the day with 13 to 15 percent coupons well, can you imagine getting a 15 percent yield on anything right now i mean it's just and i was holding them and then watching them appreciate and then eventually just flipping them and that's when i started to uh, get more into the dividend thing. I would say probably I started buying my first dividend stocks around 2011, 10 or 11. So about six, seven years down the road. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was doing that in my personal account because at the, at the time my 401k was still restricted to mutual funds. And then several years later, my company switched to Fidelity and gave the, uh, the brokerage link function, which we have the ability to for, for people who don't know, a brokerage link allows you to buy and sell whatever you want in, in your 401k. With only certain restrictions, you can't use leverage and there are certain entities that they don't let you buy um, or they warn you not to like master limited partnerships. But other than that, mm -hmm. it's pretty much a free reign. So then I could take my personal account and then the 401k and I tried to find a comprehensive strategy that had, I had blue chips all over the place and then I had mutual funds all over the place. And it got to be very complicated to figure out. I was trying to be cute. Like, well, if I have a little bit of money in a small cap growth fund and it flips, I can liquidate it, put it in something boring. And then I said, well, later down the road, I, I started saying to myself more and more, and I still believe this to this day, to really get the maximum benefit from dividend stocks and passive income, you kind of have to go all in. Yeah. If you only have 20, if you're like, I'm going to put 20% of my portfolio in dividend stocks and then the rest in like a total market fund, that's fine for total return. That's, that's fine. Um, but for, for the passive income uh, strategy that you and I and so many others in the community adhere to, you yeah. kind of have to be all in. That's my philosophy. Now, there are plenty of people who have a hybrid strategy and that's on them. But for me, if I wasn't all in, I would not be achieving fire next year. Yeah. Okay, now, that's that one point I bring up when I'm talking to people. So I tell them that I believe that there's two type, two types of dividend investors. There's the total return type. Yeah. And then there's the passive income yield on cost. The total yeah. return for the people who there's still... They're still in that mindset that asset allocation had taught us. They have that, I need a million dollars to retire or whatnot. Their, their uh, net worth is still their primary metric. But for whatever reason, they, they find some appeal to dividend stocks, whether they're aware of the historical, uh, the fact that over 100 years, 60% of the S&P's returns came from dividends or, or that they, they see something. There's some amount of evidence that lets them believe in the superiority of dividend stocks, mm -hmm. but they're still obsessed in total return. Whereas yeah. you and I, we're not so focused on our net worth. And it's not a factor. I don't quote my net worth at all when people ask me what my fire numbers are. I'm more passive income and uh, yield on cost. Yeah. And that's 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 where I am now. And I've been a purist for, I think, over two years now where I think I sold the last of my mutual funds because like I said, I, I wanted to go all in on passive income to see what it would do for me. And um, mm -hmm. as far as what my favorites are, I would say because I want to pay bills in the near term within the next year, I aim for an overall portfolio yield of 5% plus. Nice. 
So that's one thing like, well, how, as much as I love, I love watching your videos and your portfolio. Cause when you go over your top 30, most of them are all brand names. Yeah. You know, them I used to have, like I used to have Kimberly Clark and Colgate and some of those other ones that are, but I've got to the point where I can't overweight those as beautiful as they are, as good as they are for getting the job done. I need, I need to branch out into things like the real estate trust and the yep. business development companies and closed end funds, which I know you want to discuss somewhere in the video. So Absolutely. it's about, it's about fine tuning that perfect balance for me. Again, the value is totally subjective here, but for me, I have my swan stocks and then I, I that kind of give me the foundation uh, in my portfolio. And then I, I augmented with the lesser known fare, which would be the real estate trust and the BDCs and uh, the closed end funds and, and get somewhere in the middle to okay. get that 5% plus yield with growth. And that's where I am. And that's how I've decided. Uh, that's how I evaluate where to, when I was buying shares, that's where I decided where I put my capital. It's like, do I want to focus on current income or future growth and in income? And finding yeah. that balance. And so Absolutely. what my portfolio is right now is the aggregate of the judgments that I've made. And I'm actually pretty darn happy with it. Oh, I'm I bet you are. You are absolutely have to be happy with it, that it's providing for this really, really early retirement pretty soon. Yeah. Um, I have a quick question before we go further, going just a little of a step back. You were talking about this progression you had from mutual funds to um, you had some bonds in there for a while. You went yeah. through the great financial crisis. Oh, yeah. And now you've kind of emerged as a dividend purist. Was there an aha moment where you went like, hey, I'm all in on dividends and I want that because it's going to get me to financial independence the quickest? Or was it more of like a gradual thing? Like, was it just like a little bit over time? Like, when was it in this whole journey that you're like, you know what? I'm going to try to retire some somewhere in my early 40s. Did you ever have that aha moment? Well, the the 40 thing I had even back in my 20s when wow. I was I, I was voluntarily working seven days a week. Okay. And people were asking why are you working so much, and I told I was saving, I was saving about 40 to 45 percent of my mm. income at the time. I was maxing out the 401 for several years, which back then was like 16, 17,000 a year. Then I was maxing out the Roth, which back then was probably no more than 5,000 a year. And then I was saving the rest in my taxable. So okay. I was, I was aiming. So even back then I was aiming for an exit somewhere in the forties. I I always said 40 just to sound, cause it was a, a, a clean number to end on. Obviously I missed that by a little bit, but as far as an aha moment, I think if anything, it was when I started getting into the spreadsheets mm. and then being able to track my passive income and see it grow in my monthly progression. And I thought to myself, well, if I'm, if I'm owning financial entities that are not passive income producers, that's going to take away from my spreadsheets ability to tell me what my bill paying power is. And a lot of it had to do with... Um, on the side, uh, where we were in the market, because this has been a uh, um, very much a learning experience because well, I look about, about back at some of the beliefs that I had, you know, post-financial crisis. Uh, I was, a lot of us were worried about, oh, money printing was going off the charts, quantitative. We were all scared to death of inflation and the, uh, another down leg. And we've been hardly anywhere but up other than I think uh, 2013 there was and whatever year the flash crash wa was and we know we never saw that inflation in the broad economy right we've seen it in the assets <laughs> that's where all it went in that real estate in the stock market so a lot of the switching over was because I'm aware of the historical evidence for mean reversion in the markets and I try to listen to an eclectic and dynamic viewpoints of people. Like I don't want people who just reinforce my confirmation bias because mm -hmm. that's not how you learn. I want the, 
I want the market skeptics. I so for all the people who I listen to, like you, or the other all the other um, celebrities, <laughs> the passive income community. I also I listen to Jer Jeremy Grantham and Michael Burry and other people who are who bring up the historical valuations and say, you know, we are in this massively inflated market, and every it's it stays inflated and it keeps going up <laughs> every year. So it's like you just don't know um, with growth stocks and with high PE multiple stocks, which is where I was trying to keep just a little bit of money in those mutual funds mm -hmm. and mid cap and small cap. And I thought to myself, I just don't know when this is going to turn. And I don't know when the next big recession uh, is going to be or whether we'll have one or we'll just have these, what we call the rolling recessions. Cause that's what our market has turned into. Yeah. Pretty, so you don't have massive capitulation. You have, Corrections, but they're often sector specific. Like bear markets are in energy, and the energy will be down 30% when tech is up 20. And you don't see it in the broad in the SP because that's just an aggregate of it. And so you're like seeing all this. It's 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 been a learning experience being an investor for the past 10 years. Yeah. And and I've had to, I've had to constantly question my core belief systems every year because I used to be much more of a value investing purist. And I saw, I missed out on a lot. If I would have had more money, like I passed up on Apple when it was in its decline, was that 2017 or something like that? And yeah. I said, well, yeah, I thought to myself, I just don't see them. They already have such market share. I don't see how they can stay stay in the game, stay relevant. Or, or, well, and or I think back the then there was a lot of concern that it was a single product company. Um, they had, a, I know they were hoarding a lot of cash. They had a single product, the iPhone, but it, it wasn't yet until they really started branching out into services and watches and enterprise. And so a lot of that followed, but I do remember those times where for quite some time, Apple was undervalued. It was. And I remember talking about it with my friends. I remember talking about buying Amazon. It's crazy to think I could have bought Amazon back in 2010. Yeah. But I said, how can I own a company that sells everything it costs, makes no money? And I, to me, I said, how's that a business model? And what did they do? They, they done it yeah. until I think they only started turning a profit until a couple of years ago or something like that. So it's, yeah. I used to have, I used to have such a strict set of rules and used to have such a leaning towards a value bent. And I was massively overweight oil. Yeah. Throughout, Cause I did not see the secular decline in fossil fuels. I was more inflation's going to roar because I, you know, and there are some people who had convinced me that peak oil was coming and we'd be at $300 a barrel. Well, yeah. that was, Diamet that was a, a, the exact opposite of where we went. So yeah. I missed out a little bit of alpha in one of my portfolios. Um, I'm going to stop retirement. you though, real quick, Greg. I really think this is an important point you're bringing up. Greg missed out on Amazon, as did I. Um, he there were times where he might have made decisions in his portfolio that, in hindsight. Maybe he would have done a little differently, like being overweight a little bit in oil, which is something that I've done over the years as well. Um, he has had some huge winners, and we'll get to that in a minute, such as Microsoft, for example. I guess I got into Apple. I was one of the fortunate ones that took that risk when they were kind of that iPhone-centric company and it paid off. But Greg got into Microsoft in a big way. But the point I'm trying to illustrate here is... Right before the audience, Greg is sharing some of the things maybe that he learned or he would have done better or more um, uh, with more, you know, he would have maybe done a little bit better in hindsight. Yet, despite having some of those learning experiences along the way, he still is achieving the financial independence dream at 40. And so the point that I'm trying to make here is 
if you're out there at home and you're trying to, to be like Greg and you're trying to reach this goal, don't fault yourself if along the way you make a mistake or you miss a stock or you, you know, someone, everyone has this story. Someone told them, you know, told you to buy Bitcoin at a hundred dollars. In my case, it was my wife and I didn't do it. And so right. um, <laughs> there are all of these kind of stories that we have, but e despite uh, missing out on some of those opportunities, there are so many other opportunities opportunities and, um, and so much opportunity as a dividend investor to achieve fire. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can't get down on yourself for thinking about uh, what you've missed because, you know, a lot of those returns are probably not, I doubt anybody has held those returns. They're most likely those entities have gone through so many hands and people have probably sold them thinking that they're, so it's not helpful. And I, I don't get into that, uh, keeping up with the Joneses mentality mm -hmm. in finance where it's like, I keep track of what, where I need to be and what I need to do to get there while being open and listening to what other people do. I don't let it affect me. Absolutely. But um, so there are definitely learned some things along the way. Uh, wish I had been in, I got, you mentioned Microsoft. That was more of a, I want to say more luck than anything, but I bought it in 2010 and 11, back when it was considered a value stock. That yeah. was when nobody else wanted it. It had a 14, 13 to 14 PE wow. with a sub, just a sub 3% yield. And it was called, that was in the uh, Steve Ballmer area. Era. <laughs> and um, before the current CEO took over and it's considered a dog. And that just goes to show you the evidence of what happens when you buy something that's out of favor. So the reason I'm up like 1500% or whatever that yeah it's it's been a 10 bagger now for a long time and i just stopped counting because it's I, I just bought it and it it kind of allowed me in addition to some other aggressive things i had to even slightly outperform the market over a 10-year period even though i had a lot of conservative stocks in there <clears throat> as a whole it kept it kind of it kind of was like a foundation for um keeping up with a overall tech heavy index, even though I myself didn't have as much tech. Now I am much more open to owning tech, which when we get to the closed end funds, I'll talk about, but so um, it's another goal of mine every year. You just got to learn. You got to look at what you did. Mm -hmm. Were you wrong? Were you early? And, and do you do your best to try to understand um, where you fell short, why, and if you need to change something and, We've all we've all had those moments. I know you and I both had uh, the Wells Fargo experience. Yeah, where you know a bank that really just burned us. And I remember that when they were considered the flagship uh, regional bank in the, in the company. Before now, it's everyone talks about J.P. Morgan, which rightfully so because they do everything right. But you know, holding some of those dogs and and just seeing them go down and then not just, I don't mind it when a stock goes down because it's out of favor, but when it's consistently dropping the ball, you yeah. don't want to hold something to zero. Like I had the GE experience. I had GE from 2010 to 2019 or so. I can't remember when I sold it. Yeah. But by the time I finally sold it, I was in the red. Yeah, You can imagine holding a financial entity for a decade during one of the strongest bull markets we've ever had and being in the red. That teaches you, hey, I need to clean up my metrics. I need to clean up my belief system. And it's funny. I tell people I use these things as teachable moments. And I tell mm -hmm. people I had wanted to sell the company because I did not like the fact I, I tell people all the time I don't like empire builders. When you're good at one thing, when you're good at building jet engines and microwaves, you should build jet en engines and microwaves, not buy cable TV and not buy banking institutions and then hoping that it all works out. Yeah, well, that's what we did. We hoped. And I tell people, well, I wanted to sell, but I didn't because I didn't want to generate capital gains taxes. Yeah. Instead of, instead of selling and paying taxes, I ended up taking a loss, which I would have now in hindsight, I would have much rather sold for for profit. So that was a learning experience. Yeah. In itself. I have a comment on GE. Um, 
one thing I would mention on that particular company, and I recall is a big part of their downfall, is they had a financing division like yep. GE Credit or GE yep. Capital or something. And they were basically making loans to their customers so that their customers could use the loan to purchase GE products such as those yeah. jet engines. And so for me, sometimes people in the community ask me to analyze stocks and I'll look at something like um, Ford or GM. And I remember when I looked at GM or Ford, I forget which one, probably both of them. I think it was GM. They had a huge kind of financing division and it kind of reminded me a little bit of GE. Hey, I own one of them. I own Caterpillar. I know you sold it, Greg, but yes. for me, I own yeah. it. It's gone through the roof because of yeah. Kathy Wood, but um, I'm always careful and have a healthy amount of skepticism with that company because like GE, they do have a pretty good financing division where they yeah. finance customers to purchase Caterpillar equipment. And so just for anyone out there who's doing fundamental analysis and looking at individual stocks, we can all learn from the GE experience. And oh, even absolutely. if we own companies that have some parallels to GE, we just got to be a little extra careful and cautious in our analysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could. I'm glad you brought up Caterpillar. That's another thing. Um, when you talked, you're a part of your uh, prior question was my subjective take on the stocks I like. And I said, yeah. I, I have to kind of, I can't overweight those 2%, 2 to 3% yielders because I'll never get. And another thing is with, with the, with the be willing to sell, one of the benefits of having four different account structures, because I have my taxable, I also have a Roth IRA, a 401 and the HSA, is I can create a set of rules for, for each of them and have them act as their own independent entity, which I do. But then as, as a whole, they fit in. So they're all uh, pieces of the puzzle. And when I post my spreadsheets, when I post my graphs and my charts, those are an aggregate of all those accounts. Yes. So I have the responsibility of figuring out where, what goes where, and then um, figuring out um, things like the tax, tax laws, of course, have a huge play on that. Like, yeah. you know, I make sure I only, I put my REITs and my BDCs or anything that's not qualified dividend in a sheltered account, because mm -hmm. I don't get the 15% tax cap, which will actually be zero when I, when I no longer work. Um, yeah. And then things like Mastered Limited Partnerships. I have in my taxable account where you get the full benefits, but um, the the decision to sell can often be a tricky one. And one thing I've taught myself is to never fall in love with the company. And when I buy something for a specific reason, and you brought up Caterpillar, which was I wanted that industrial exposure because mm -hmm. they are the best. Yeah, they're the flagship heavy heavy machinery and equipment maker in the world, and but it's still a massively capital intensive company and it's hugely cyclical. Mm -hmm. And when I buy, when, you know, and I was buying them at a 4% yield, which I thought was totally appropriate for, I believe they could grow, but then watching the price go up and the yield contract and seeing it go down to the twos <laughs> and thinking to myself, well, if you're a yield on cost investor, and this is what everyone should ask themselves, if you're buying something with a 2% yield yeah. and you only think you can grow five, six, 8% tops, how long is it going to take you to get back to that five? How long is it going to take you? Whereas if you buy something, which I, I believe to be in the sweet spot, which is the 5% yield of 5% growth. Yeah. You'll be much further ahead in the game. In fact, five and five is, is a very popular number. I got it from a book. There's another guy who I really like on Instagram, the dividend athlete. Yeah, he's all about he's his whole thing is the four to five percent yield with four to five growth. Like he doesn't yeah. like anything lower than that. And I have a book that showed the efficacy of a five on five strategy. So when I, when I when a holding of mine, even if I really liked it, like I could have I could have made Caterpillar a forever company. I mean, they are a blue chip. Even in that cyclical industry, they are the blue chip of the industry. But because I had it in a tax sheltered account and I was up like 60 percent in six months. Again, though, I operate under, under the idea that every investing idea has to be weighed against the opportunity cost of your next best idea. Yeah. 
And that's that's the opportunity cost. That's a phrase I use. I learned it from studying economic philosophy. It's a, a, it's a term I use at work all the time. And when you ha only have so many dollars to play with, it's a quintessential factor. If I can't create money, if I can't save enough money to create a new position, I have to often liquidate an existing position. And when I see something like Caterpillar shoot off to the moon for, you know, I know you say uh, largely due to Kathy Wood. Uh, she probably has, she's definitely, uh, we, uh, we could do a whole um, Zoom meeting on my opinion. Absolutely. Because I, I listen to her and her critics too. But um, I, I see that. And I see that I see the valuation, the multiple go up and the yield contract. Because remember, there's the inverse relationship between the two, which is one of the beautiful metrics of our system. We get that. Mm -hmm. in, we get rewarded when our stocks go down. Yeah. Another thing I learned, you know, going from mutual fund strategy, I wanted to get rewarded when my stocks go down, which I didn't get in the past when I was just owning growth mutual funds. So seeing that happen in Caterpillar and the fact I had it in a tax sheltered account, it seemed to me it would it would have been, I don't want to use the word reckless, but it would have been a waste of an opportunity. Of course, the price is still up there. In fact, it's probably gone up even a little more since I sold it, but that doesn't matter to me because the rising tide has been lifting all boats. Yeah. So when I'm making moves and they both go up, it's kind of a lateral move. But I saw I, I liquidated it and I put it in something that had a five to six percent yield. And my overall income was now higher than if I would have put something had that from the start because I took profits in an elevated entity that I believed could not come up with a fundamental reason why I was trading at that. And I put in something that was, and I actually have a history. Uh, one of my favorites was when I sold Kraft Heinz in 2017, I think, or I, on a better day, I could remember this. It was, it was somewhere between 15 and 17, but I sold it in 93 a share. Yeah. I don't know if you've looked at Kraft Heinz recently. Oh, I have, I <laughs> definitely looked at it. And Where I is sold it these it days, like like fifties or something, or no, it's in the thirties, I believe. Oh, it's still in the thirties. <laughs> yeah. But here's the story about that. I owned it. I bought it when it was super cheap. I think at the time, my Morningstar Dividend Investor newsletter, which I've been a subscriber to for like twelve years now, or, or close to that, um, had recommended it. But I think at the time when I was buying it, it had a four to five percent yield. And then I think it was when Warren Buffett started buying it. that people right. that said the Buffett factor yeah. took it well above its fair value. And I got a special dividend, I remember, which was like a couple grand, which was nice for just no reason. I think that was part of some deal he worked out. And then I just kept seeing the price go up. And I kept saying, OK, this was a mid-tier packaged food company trading it now a frothy multiple. And I was telling myself, even the best managed packaged food company in the world is constrained by packaged food. You're mm -hmm. not going to jack up the prices on packaged food or else no one will buy it. I said, this is a very competitive market. Generics and like the Kroger brand, the Walmart brand, they're cutting into margins and you see it in the good ones. Even the ones like General Mills and Campbell Soup, yeah. they got to deal with it too. And Kraft Heinz was never on that level of quality. Yeah, they had a narrow moat at best compared to a wider moat of like Campbell's yeah. or even Clorox and whatnot. So I yeah. said, it's in the 90s. I'm, I'm out of here. I took my money, uh, cashed in a massive profit. And then I think within the year, it was already collapsing into the into down. And like I said, even now it's in the 30s. And there was a, I sold Philip Morris at its peak in 2017, too just on pure valuation call because even the best company in the world if it's too high a pe multiple and taxes aren't a consideration if it's in a tax sheltered account i have no qualms about liquidating it Absolutely. because i've seen i know the principle of mathematical mean reversion which says it's the longer an entity trades above its historical average it necessitates a downdraft and you see it all the time and you can see it in Heck, all the tobacco companies, they peaked around that time when they had low historical yields, high historical PE multiples, and then they've been nothing in a decline. Now, I think they're probably the cheapest sector in the market, which we could yeah. talk about uh, 
the sin stocks and the, the qualitative metrics, but those are just some things I've learned. So I have a um, few questions for you. One question is taking a step back and selling stocks. Um, mm -hmm. I totally understand where you're coming from. Well, first a comment, then a question. So first a comment to the community. I present my own perspective online. Greg presents his own perspective. You at home, you may resonate more with me, more with Greg, or a combination or something completely different. And so we all have to find what works best for us. And I'll tell you just off the bat for folks who have been following me for a while, I have a strategy that's a little bit different than Greg's in that I try not to sell and I will hold some of these two percenters and it does delay my fire. But I will say that Greg is retiring younger than I am. And he has a strategy that has optimized for that. So that's just something to keep in mind. It doesn't necessarily mean one is better than the other, but it does mean that you should probably think about your own goals at home. And if one of your goals is, hey, I want to retire by the time I'm 40, definitely listen to the things that Greg is saying because they resonate with me a lot and they make a lot of sense. And there definitely are opportunity costs with holding some of the stocks I hold like Caterpillar. Now, you it may, it may kind of, you, it may beg the question, well, Ian, why do you hold that? For me, I look at it more as a multi-generational play. And so I'm thinking not just for my own fire, but even future generations. And I feel that over very, very long periods of time that the um, fundamentals will catch up with the valuation on Caterpillar. But I do realize in the next decade, I don't know if it will because it has gotten um, it has gotten pretty, pretty much up there. And so that was just some commentary I want to follow on because this is fascinating, everything that Greg is saying here. Um, but the other, now I'm kind of moving to the question. The question that came out of all of this is um, Greg mentioned he has a, a account structure that spans different types of accounts, such as taxable accounts, retirement accounts. My question, Greg, is when you retire in your early 40s, are you going to tap into these retirement accounts at all? Or is it just going to be on the individual account side of things, the taxable account? How does all that work? That's a great question. And that's one, unfortunately, um, in hindsight, I wish I would have maybe maneuvered my money around a little bit differently because I'm overweight in my tax sheltered accounts, which okay. isn't necessarily a terrible thing. I actually have a friend who's trying to help me come up with, we can quantify this. Uh, we were talking about the, the early withdrawal penalties and whatnot for retirement accounts. And he, he believes that if you can achieve enough alpha um, in a tax sheltered account by like flipping assets or liquidating stocks when you know you should, like I did with Caterpillar, yeah. you might be able to offset that penalty. But um, I, I absolutely will have to make early withdrawals from okay. that. Not right away. And one of the benefits, what I've done now is by continuing to work, I'm building up a massive cash pile and I'm gonna hold that. I consider my portfolios done. Like I'm not yeah. putting any new money in. I'm just all my, the drip, drip money I get goes right back in the shares. And that's what is going to get my numbers to where they need to be. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to have this cash cushion and it's going to carry me hopefully for the rest of next year so that I can allow my drip system to continue. And then eventually when I actually do need to, if I haven't decided to pick up some work on the side, which I'm completely open to, I'm not adamant, adamantly setting a rule that I'm not going to do anything. I'm completely open to it as needed. Then I will most likely have to um, pull money out and pay the full tax amount because you lose the qual you, you lose the quali qualified dividend benefit in a, tax sheltered account. I call it a tax baptism. You don't get the qualified dividend. It's completely washed. It's just counts as income. So I'd have to pay that in addition to a potential 10%, which knowing being aware of that fact is part of the reason why I want to take my numbers 
like I said at the beginning, although on paper, I generate enough passive income to pay all my bills now, I'm not quitting work right now. Yeah. I don't want to skim by and I don't necessarily have all the tax details squ squared away. But I also, I have a good relationship with Fidelity. They're one of the, the best companies for retirement. They're pro I think they're the biggest retirement yeah. asset manager on the planet. And they're very helpful calling them up. I most likely will probably set up either a traditional brokerage account or open a checking account with them. And that way I will just have, I'll be able to take some dividend payments, pull them out. Fidelity will record them. Whether they, if they can come up with a system where they auto tax it for me, that'd be great. I don't know if they do, but even if they don't, then I'll just get my bill at the end of the year, like everything else. And then I'll have a checking account with them most likely and be able to pay bills. But that's, it's not something that, that, deters me from wanting yeah. to embrace fire early it's a lot of people because and that's a, a lot of people are scared to death they, about putting money in a retirement account or they don't want to say well you can't touch it until you're 65 where the rule is actually 59 and a half or there's even a, a stipulation for to get it at 55 with no penalty there's a lot of them which we don't need to go down that rabbit hole but um i would say be aware of it but if you want to embrace a degree of fire, um, don't let that don't don't let that stop you. I would say yeah. probably the, the best thing to do would be for someone not to put all their money. If you are going to do what I do and try to leave the workforce early, you might not want to try to hit that twenty. I think it's twenty thousand a year. Yeah, in the four hundred one, maybe don't max that out. Yeah, maybe. Um. Take to, if you're going to put 20, if you're going to save, save the majority of it in a taxable, because uh, if if someone were to embrace a strategy like yours, where they just buy blue chips and they plan on never selling them, because as you say, it's a generational thing, you'd actually pay fewer taxes doing that than if you would own those dividend stocks in a 401, because you get that qualified dividend benefit where you're paying at most 15 percent and uh, if you're never selling. This is a really good point. I, I want to just underscore one thing that Greg just said is you may be watching and have a considerable amount of money in your retirement accounts, but you may just because of what society or your company, your boss, um, the financial media has programmed you with. This is how I think about it is you can't touch that money or it's off right, limits correct. only when you retire at a traditional age. But basically what Greg is saying here is think outside of the box. If you really want something and you want to go for it, such as retiring at 40, you have to think outside of the box. And even if you have a traditional retirement account, in addition to individual accounts, um, it may make sense considering all of your options. And so that I thought that was a really good point that you made because just even before this interview, I would have even not thought of that because I've been programmed so many times, Ian, you can't touch that. But um, I, I, I like how you're thinking very creatively about all of the options in front of you. It, and I'm glad you brought up programming because that's one thing that I like to teach people is that we've all been programmed that we think we need to work until 65 and that we need to uh, put all our money in a, in a 401k yeah. and that we need to dollar cost average ourselves into a, a, a uh, comprehensive market fund. Mm -hmm. And then we embrace the 60, 40 rule and the 4% rule to pay bills. And those are all great. And I, 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 I understand why the, financial institutions teach them because it's the easiest for mm -hmm. pe most people, yeah. but they're not, uh, a lot of those systems were created in the eighties. I think the 401k if, and feel free to fact check me on this, but I believe those were created in 82, 83, somewhere conveniently right at the beginning of the secular bull market, right after the secular bear market from 1968 to 82. So, I mean, a lot of those the systems and rules were created at a time where also interest rates were in the double digits. Yeah. So you could come up with a 60-40 rule where you have some hybrid 
stocks to bonds. Now, I often tell people, I think the 60-40 rule is broken. Mm -hmm. I'd be scared to death of having 40% of my net worth in bonds. Agreed. At these yields. And I'm a big believer without getting too technical here, although I think we've already got, <laughs> we've already gone down a lot of uh, tangent boulevards here, but um, I, I don't see the 10 year treasury going above three to 4% this decade, if not longer. I think there's a, it's, there's a lot of macroscopic reasons mm -hmm. why the government does not ever want to see interest rates go back to where they were in the seventies and eighties. Absolutely agree. We're, we're in a sec, it's a secular change. And if you believe that's true, then you have to question a lot of conventional beliefs and in the process of questioning these is what led me down to this path that, well, I don't want to just, I don't want a dollar cost average in the funds and, and then just hope, hope I have a seven figure net worth when I need it. That's no, I want to, I want to come up with a system that I know what my numbers are. I know what, what cash flow is. I know what my monthly cash flow is going to be and I can custom tailor that. And that's what we do as dividend investors. So, the people like you, the people like me, the people in our community, we've got here all because we're not happy with the boilerplate financial philosophy, which is mm -hmm. work until 65, power through it, no matter whether you like it or not. Dollar, dump all your money in a 401 and uh, dollar cost average into target date funds or whatever. And there's nothing wrong with those. Yeah. But LD has some amazing target date funds. They do. And they, those target date funds are also really good for um, college savings as well. Yeah. If you know you have a, a child and you know that they're going to college in XYZ year, those target date funds can do a lot of the heavy lifting for something like that. Yeah. And I tell a lot of people, a lot of my coworkers who are in their mid 20s and don't want to micromanage, put in a low cost, low cost fund. Don't think about it. Then if on the side you want to open an IRA, a Roth IRA, or a taxable account, then you can buy some stuff, buy some stocks you like, buy some real estate trust. But yeah. um, for for people like you and I, you kind of you have to have like you have to question the norm, Absolutely. understand why they teach it, and then where the faults are. And so it's like in questioning everything that I'm taught, finding out where the shortcomings are is how I arrived where I am today. The now, built -built system. Greg, I want to ask you, I got a, a bunch more questions and I know we're, we're running on uh, up against the hour mark here, but I think we should just keep going because this is such good um, information. I, everyone, please go ahead and smash the like button and uh, share your comments below your appreciation for Greg. Make sure to check out his Instagram again, The Dividend Monster. You've got to check it out. Um, Greg, I'd be curious if you could go over what are some of your favorite stocks, closed end funds, investments that you like the most? You have a portfolio. What are some of your favorites in there? Well, my favorites, obviously, if for anyone who knows who see my spreadsheets, Microsoft is my largest holding. Yeah. Not necessarily because it's my favorite, but like I said, I bought it when it was cheap with a cost basis of like 3000 and now I've got a 1500% return. So it's blossomed up. I've actually been a net seller of Microsoft simply because I call that trapped equity. Yeah. And it's like, it's not, it's not getting me the most yield. It's not going to help me pay my bills any sooner, but you can't discount or you can't ignore the sheer heft that company has its earnings, its earnings growth, its balance sheet. I mean, there's, We've never seen anything like it. Yeah. As Josh Brown on CNBC frequently says, it defies economic textbooks, what these tech companies have been able to do, how yeah. they keep their moats way longer than what uh, classical economics um, taught companies should be able to do. So I have Microsoft is kind of the leader. Um, I, I'm very hesitant about trimming too much more because that is a taxable asset to me. And I don't like paying $2,000 in taxes like I did last year, yeah. which was very unpleasant because I didn't have that in cash. So I had to work it. <laughs> so yeah. um, uh, Johnson & Johnson, another swan stock I own. It's my second largest holding and it's it's there mostly because it's one of the first ones I bought. So it's just from having it. I think I've tripled my money on that. Yeah, I'm pretty close, but it's just a, it's just the benefit of, of 
holding something and dripping it, a dripping a blue blue chip company with a wide moat. <coughs> we call this Swan Stocks. And you, when you talk about your videos, where you don't have to obsess over the balance sheet of like uh, Pepsi and Johnson and Johnson or Duke Energy, you just know they're going to sit there and they're going to do their thing. And so I tend to leave them alone. And I'm not adding to any of them because, like I said, I don't, I'm very hesitant about getting into more of the three, the two to three percenters, but I let them carry me. They're kind of like the carriage. They're the, they're the stallions and the horses pulling the buggy. Um, McDonald's is up there too. Another one that on one hand, it's funny because it's a very controversial stock to talk about because everybody will be like, it's so overvalued. Which it kind of is because their revenues are even lower than they were 10 years ago, which is kind of hard to to, fact, to fathom. But they're, they also have real estate in there. Their profits are up, even though that their revenues have come down. Yeah. So it's one of those. The companies like that, which is why I have a, a Morningstar premium membership, because I can't always crack the balance sheet. Sometimes they're just too cryptic for me. Mm-hmm. And I might draw the wrong conclusions say this is this is going to be trap money. So I let a company who's probably the most well respected in the industry, their analysts come up using their discounted cash flow models, which they do it better than I will come up with a fair value. And that's what I use. So uh, McDonald's is up there. PepsiCo's up there. Love them. Yeah. Um, let's see some of my other favorites are. Uh, my BlackRock Science and Technology Closed End Fund is one of my favorites too. This is this is a great fund. Uh, one for one reason, BlackRock is probably the best fund manager in the industry. They probably have the largest amount of assets. And I listen to Rick Reeder all the time on CNBC. He manages like trillions of dollars cumul- uh, combined with uh, equities and fixed income. So he's always on top of his game, and he always has coherent thoughts about the market and I respect BlackRock and I like their closed end funds. And the reason I like the, the science and technology fund is it gives you a basket of a lot of these secular growth names that I would never buy like Nvidia or Salesforce. Yeah. It has, it even has more Microsoft. It has Apple in there. It has um, Facebook. It has Google. It has, I think the comms are in there, maybe Broadcom and Qualcomm are in there. It's got Square, a bunch of names, but they turn a lot of these secular growth names into income paying entities by using a covered call strategy. And that's one beautiful thing about a lot of these closed end funds. A lot of them will sell covered calls for you. Not all of them, but some of the good ones, especially the BlackRock ones, will use a little bit of leverage and also sell covered calls. And through that mechanism, the uh, BlackRock Science and Technology Fund actually has a four, almost 5% cash distribution. Wow. And it's had, it had two dividend increases last year. And I think both were double digit. It had like a 10% increase in the spring and then a 13 increase in the fall percent. So if I had, I can't access my spreadsheet right now, but if I, I looked at my yield, I think my yield on cost is already in the high sixes, close to nice. seven. And that's for a fund that I've only owned a year. Yeah. So that, that growth is getting in there. And then I also have my Reeves Utility and Income Fund, UTG, um, which is my favorite, one of my favorite infrastructure funds. And through a company, Reeves, the guy who manages them and manages the company overall, he is brilliant when it comes to utilities. He's probably the best brain and he writes, he's, he's written uh, articles on Seeking Alpha. He's been featured in Barron's. So I trust his judgment. And one of the reasons I use some of these closed-end funds is kind of like to supplement sectors that I don't have a lot of passion to study. And utilities and banks and finance are probably the two that I don't. Like, if you were to ask me today what the difference between Duke Energy and um, First Energy and Southern Company would be, I would probably draw a blank because to me, they're not there. It's, it's kind of hard to get alpha from utilities because regulate a lot of the ones that are regulated, they're kind of constrained 
to what the government the government lets them do, right? And how much they charge. So they don't have a unique business model that you have to you have to really obsess over. You don't have to dig into the minutia like you would with other. So I don't I don't like to read about utility companies. So I have funds that buy them for me. And the UTG is one of my favorite, which is that Reeves one, and also the the Cohen and Steers, the UTF fund, which I have in my HSA, is another one of my favorites. Who that is more of a broad infrastructure fund instead of utilities. It's less it has fewer utilities. I think it's forty percent utility compared to sixty percent in UTG. But it's also got a lot of industrial companies, and it's also got a global footprint. And they have an amazing track record. And Cohen and Steers is another company that I have a huge amount of respect for. And I also have a real estate fund with them, RQI. It's their real estate equity and income fund. It has close, I was buying it when it had like a 7.57% yield. And that gives me a basket of real estate companies that I would not normally buy because they're lower yielding ones like the cell tower REITs, which are the largest, the largest REITs right now in our index, like American Tower mm. and um, the one that starts with a C. Can't remember, but uh, Prologis is in there. It's got um, some other digital storage reads, so it gives me a good exposure to a lot of basket reads that I can own. And then I go out in my own. I own my net lease reads on the side, like our, our favorite Realty Income and yeah. also P Carry and uh, Medical Properties Trust and stuff like that. So um, those funds are my favorite. Iron Mountain is another one of my favorites. Um, not that they have the widest moat. Or even if they have a moat, different people <laughs> debate on whether they have a moat or not. But I believe that they're a business that has a lot of demand with their physical storage. I don't believe is in a secular decline, like a lot of people say. And digital storage is in nothing but have has nothing but tailwinds for it. So that company and their hybrid business model, I believe it should at least, if it can give me the five and five, it's got the 5% yield. And if it can grow at 5%, which I think is, is kind of low for what some people claim, but I don't like to go with the highest numbers. I like to stay grounded, but if it can give me a five and five, I'll stay, I'll stay, uh, I'll, I'll be happy with that one. Um, other favorites are Enbridge, my favorite non MLP midstream company. And the beautiful thing about Enbridge is they're not only, a midstream company that operates in both Canada and the States. They off, they also have a regulated utility business in Canada, and they also have a blossoming and growing green energy. Hmm. So they've got the old school fossil fuels and they're investing money into the, the future. And I like them too, because I can have them in a tax sheltered account because they don't generate a case. They're not structured as a, as a limited partnership like the other two I own. Um, and what is this? Enbridge. Yeah, Enbridge. Great. I love that company. Um, what was the one other I was about to say? Uh, well, I don't Anything remember. about but, Altria? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Altria <laughs> is another one. Yes, that's another one of my favorites. Um. Yeah, Greg, thank you. Uh, I'll step in because you've been going uh, off of uh, so many good stocks here and yeah. many of which I own. So it's really um, wonderful to hear this, that uh, great minds think alike. And it's also good, though, to get another perspective because I don't discuss this a lot on the channel, these um, closed end funds. And it seems Correct. like Greg has had some really good experience with those. And I think one of my biggest takeaways is you use the first one you talked about the BlackRock science and tech one to not only get exposure to tech, but to get some income out of it as well. Because if you just go out and buy Alphabet stock, there's no dividend, there's no income, but because that closed end fund writes those covered calls, it offers income for a dividend investor. So I thought that was a, a uh, really fabulous takeaway. I get questions on my channel all the time about closed end funds. And honestly, I don't know how to answer because I have not invested in closed end funds before. So it's great um, that you offered that primer to all of us just on what you're doing and accomplishing with those funds. I also thought it was really interesting that you're using those funds to get exposure to certain sectors where you just don't want to obsess over one stock versus the other. And I think that's a really good point because when 
we, the whole purpose of all this dividend investing is not to spend all day analyzing stocks, because if we did that, we would be creating a small business of sorts. Yeah. Um, and I do, and I do uh, look at my dividend portfolio as a small business of sorts, but it should be a small business that requires not too much overhead, because I think all of us want the fire to be out, able to go out there and do more fun things with our time. And that's actually my next question is, with you approaching fire so soon from now, how will your life change? And what are you going to do in your spare time? What are you going to do with your free time? How do you think your daily routine might look once, you, once you're actually living this dream? Well, not to sound boring, but the thing that I look forward to the most is getting eight to nine hours of sleep. Yeah. Because with me working, I work 12 hour shifts now and me being sometimes borderline insomnia slash work anxiety. A lot of those nights, you don't have you don't have a lot of wiggle room on a getting up early for a 12 hour shift. If you have a restless night, you're going to get punished for it the next day when you go in. So something so basic as just sleeping in, like I fantasize, I visualize what sleeping in or may, maybe even taking naps throughout the day for just a couple weeks yeah. might do for my overall physical well being, of my whole body sense of well being. And it's just something that it's not very exciting, but it's something that I've missed. I don't always get a good enough sleep, especially on work nights. Yeah. Pride just doesn't happen. And it shows up. <laughs> it's manifested itself in, in a lot of ways in a, in a negative way in my, in my life, which I can tell. And that's another reason why I know I need to wrap this part of my career up. Um, so I look forward to that. I look forward to catching up on a lot of my recreational study pursuits. I've got to finish studying uh, European history and finish studying Western philosophy. And then I'm also studying a lot of classical economics, uh, the Austrian School of Economics, the Chicago School of Ex Economics. And I'm also going to study objectivism, which was Ayn Rand's philosophy. And I'm probably gonna read a couple of her books. And then on top of that, definitely wanna get into a more consistent exercise routine, yeah. um, which I will have to do because I do burn a lot of calories at work, but my body has certainly taken a beating yeah. while in steel toed boots on slapping around on concrete yeah. for 12 hours. Like my, my tissues, I have to do a lot of stretching. I have to do a lot of myofascial work and foam rolling just to maintain, not making any progress, but just not to fall apart. I have to do all this maintenance work. So a lot of my time is just dedicated to making sure I can at least function the next day. And so I look forward to creating a system. I look forward to not wearing shoes for like a couple of weeks because letting my feet heal other than the bare minimum, like to go to the store, little things that, but they mean a lot to me because I can, I can feel the consequences of not having them. And they're a massive driver for me to get this project finished. Mm -hmm. And other than that, um, it's, it's open. It's wide open for me. Like I, I will be responsive. The only thing I have to make sure I do is I don't fall into a state where I become so bored yeah. that I go out and spend more money because then all my metrics will not be worth anything if I capitulate and give in to emotional purchasing or like mm -hmm. doing things out of need. So that I, I have a lot of, I have a lot of fine tuning to do, but I don't have to worry about that until I get there. Yeah. And the, the reason why I'm working now and the reason why I'm going to have at least three grand in passive income every month is you're going to give me, a, it's going to give me that wiggle room and it's going to keep growing. And hopefully it's going to grow even without the drip. Hopefully it's going to grow faster than what my costs are. Otherwise, what's the point, right? Uh, that's a, you want yield and growth. Um, and so I'll, I will hopefully have the ability to add new hobbies. And if not, the reason why I say lean fire or barista fire, are those are the terms that people often adhere to for when they're either 
living a very restrained lifestyle or living a lifestyle open to the idea of picking up income producing projects, whether it's part-time work or doing checking out some of these online things like drop shipping or affili mm -hmm. affiliated marketing, maybe creating a, a channel of my own yeah. to I can communicate like you and uh, the other celebrities in the industry do like Joseph Carlson or yeah. and Darth Dividend and um, uh, who are the other one? Well, I follow so many, but um, Gen X, Gen X Dividend. And oh God. Well, he's the, he's the big money. He's the, he's the big money. He's, he's showing off how he gets uh, thousands and thousands of dollars a month. Yeah. He's a multi-million. I don't know why he's still working. I mean, I guess he says it's because he wants to make sure he and his family are well provided for, but yeah. If I had his numbers, I'd be I'd be in the golden land right now. But um, yeah, he's a good one too. He's another one who has a lot of the uh, a lot of the blue chips and just sticks with them for the most part. But um, it's just I I just I know what I know what my body is telling me, and then my body is telling me that I need to I need to not be doing what I'm doing. Yeah, but, well, I think um, this is a really important point because I would say a lot of people think of fire is kind of all or nothing. It's like, okay, I'm going to turn off work and then I'm retired. But when you think about dividend investing, it's not necessarily the traditional retirement that is portrayed on TV or in the media that you're out at the golf course or something. There are so many nuances to what you can do with your day. And I think it's important that you mention you're going to stay, you're going to keep your mind sharp. You're going to keep it sharp by studying different things. You're going to keep your body in good shape by one, recovering, getting the sleep that you need, but two, yeah. continuing to exercise and enjoying that exercise. I think three, you're also just thinking, well, now that I don't have to work, what are some projects that I could work on that might produce a little bit of side income to kind of help out, but they're more aligned with what I really want to contribute to society in the next chapter of my life. And I like mm -hmm. this idea and I hope to see you my friend on YouTube or a podcast or somewhere on the internet, because I think your story is so important for people to hear. And I know some people do it. They make a full-time living on YouTube. Um, but uh, certainly in my case, that is, uh, it's nowhere near that. But what I would say right. is it's possible to generate income from these types of endeavors. And for someone in your shoes who already has your expenses, basically covered by dividends, just that little bit of extra income, it makes a difference. And so this is Correct. really important for people to hear that when you're thinking about your early retirement or your financial freedom, it's not necessarily have to be, hey, I'm just traveling the world or I'm out on the golf course, but there's many different ways to approach it. And I think the other thing that's layered into what you just said is some of the best things in life, it doesn't, you don't have to retire and have a Ferrari or a big mansion or something to enjoy life. There are things in life that are either free or very low cost that are more exciting and more enjoyable. And Greg is saying just in his own case, and I can, I can relate to this as a father with two young kids and a job and all kinds of things going on, sleep. How many of us, I, I, by raise of hands, I, I imagine like 99% of the people watching right now don't get enough sleep. And so just something like that, which oh. is free, that is one of the most rewarding parts of, of uh, an early fire. And so I'm really happy that you shared those, um, those insights with everyone today. Yeah, I, I absolutely have zero interest in being in a Ferrari. I, I, my favorite thing, that I'm more peace of mind and not being aggravated yeah. is much more valuable to me than a flashy car. I mean, it's, it's really not, it's just the base, like I said, the, the free stuff, the basic stuff, just peace and quiet, not having to deal with traditional work elements, the, yeah. the, the stressful ones, you know, um, without going into detail, but I mean, absolutely. And we've all been there. Um, I think most people watching who have had a traditional job, myself included, there are times where it can get stressful. And I think the modern workforce, it gets you thinking, well, how many decades can you last? And so that's probably going through the mind of, of a lot of people watching today. And so what I would 
say, Greg, at this point, um, I could keep asking more and more questions, but I want to be respectful of your time, my friend, and also the viewers. Maybe we'll do even a, um, a uh, segment two at some point in the future. I just want to thank you so much for sharing your valuable time with everyone, because you do have to get up early tomorrow, I believe, for a 12-hour shift. And so I, my alarm goes off at five in the morning. Yeah. So we want to let this man get his rest and um, eat some food and enjoy the rest of his evening. But I just want to really thank you because the the information and the story and the journey that you brought to the community today, I believe this is um, unlike, I don't, I don't think something like this even exists yet on, on YouTube. I, I haven't seen a video quite like this. And so everyone, if you appreciate what, what Greg has contributed here, please do smash the like button please get to his Instagram. I will link to it in the pinned comment, show him some support. And um, hopefully we'll see him in the future, even more on Instagram or other places on the internet. But just uh, thank you uh, so much, my friend. We all really appreciate it. And also um, one thing I'll say is in terms of like a disclaimer, what Greg mentioned today, what I mentioned, it's not, I'll do my disclaimers. I'll do like an outro segment after this, but I just want to mention it's not investment advice. He's just sharing his personal journey. It's just fun and entertainment. Um, and you certainly want to consult a financial advisor. It's, it's no tax advice Absolutely. or financial advice here. And um, in terms of a disclosure as well, the stocks Greg mentioned, I mentioned um, either we both own or one or the other of us own. But again, at the uh, in the description below, I've got a detailed um, dis disclosure and disclaimer, and that uh, applies to both of both of us today. And so I just want to uh, make sure to to share that with everyone. And uh, thank you so much again, Greg. Thank you very much for having me, and hopefully we can have more of these because I've got a lot more. Uh technical details to share as I'm sure that you do. And so uh, I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, I real, really appreciate it, my friend. All right, everyone. So what we're going to do at this point is we're going to say bye to Greg. I'm going to see you. I'm going to do a really quick outro segment after this. And so I'll catch you all in one minute. All right, everyone. I really hope you enjoyed that epic interview with Greg today. Again, he's the Dividend Monster on Instagram. Please go ahead and smash the like button to show some support for our guest on the channel today. Please go ahead and subscribe to show your appreciation for him sharing that knowledge. And let's just all congratulate Greg in the comments below for reaching that dream, for reaching the dream of financial freedom, for living off of dividend stocks at 40 years of age. What an amazing accomplishment. And he's doing this on a normal job, on a normal, normal job. And so that is so motivating and exciting to all of us in the community out there who one day hope to be where Greg is right now. And so let's thank him again and make sure to check him out on his Instagram channel. And before I leave today, in terms of a full disclosure, we mentioned a lot of stocks in the video today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on the screen right now. And what you see in front of your eyes, I also include these in the description below the video description on YouTube. All of the stocks mentioned on the screen now are um, stocks that I personally own in my personal dividend stock portfolio. I'm also illustrating the ones that Greg owns as well in a separate column in his personal dividend stock portfolio. I just want to make sure that everyone in the community is aware that in terms of full disclosure, either Greg and or I own the stocks that we're sharing on the screen right now. Also, before leaving today, in terms of a friendly disclaimer, today's video is not investment advice. I'm not a licensed financial advisor. Today's video is just for your fun and entertainment. And uh, please do go ahead and consult a licensed financial advisor before making any investing related decisions. It's possible to lose a lot of money in the stock market. And the same goes for Greg. He's not a licensed financial advisor. He's just sharing his journey here for fun and entertainment um, here on YouTube. And and um, all right, everyone, thank you so much for watching the video today. I'll see you in the comments below and have a wonderful week.